Good morning, everyone. Uh, we will get underway right on time because this is a uh, fairly short one-hour session slot with three separate presentations. So we will jump right in here. Uh, I'm Rob Lansfield, and I'll be chairing this session, which is called Where To Next? Emerging Practices in Location Awareness and Online Publication. So as a session assembled from individual uh, paper submissions, uh, we found some sorts of common threads here, but there are only three uh, distinct presentations. The first speaker is Mark Check, Director of Information and Interactive Technology at the Museum of Science Boston, who will be speaking about lighting the way, indoor location services with white light. Excellent, thank you. So yes, I'm Mark Check, Director of Information and Interactive Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston. I will speak quickly so I can make sure that I leave time for my colleagues here. Um, wanted to talk about an interesting project we've been working on uh, over the last year, year and a half. Um, one we've been really excited about. I apologize, thank you. So we've been really excited about this particular project. Uh, you know, I've been in museums for about 15 years now, and uh, one of the challenges we've had, especially as mobile has become more prevalent, is you know how do we connect our virtual assets, that virtual environment, to the actual physical environment in the museums? Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons we want to be able to do this. We want to be able to just simply connect all of our virtual assets, whether they're video collections, interpretations. Um, to the actual spaces and the objects within the museum. We want to offer a depth of content uh, larger than what we can possibly put um, on label copy and other traditional methods within the museum. We also want to make use of the devices that people are bringing to museums now. I mean, these are, you know, it, it's an amazing age where people are bringing in mobile devices um, that not only allow us a different type of portal and a different type of means to deliver digital information, but are often personalized. And as we talk about things like accessibility, we find that mobile devices have a lot of personalization to them that address particular accessibility needs. Um, so it's a great tool to be able to deliver content on. Now, museums have been doing mobile tours uh, for quite a while, and um, we've done some really good ones and some really bad ones as a museum, and I'm guilty of doing many bad ones. Um, but one of the things that we've been looking at that they really lack is that contextual awareness. Um, and, and by contextual, we mean, you know, do we know the person behind that device, who they are, how they want their information, um, where they are in the museum, what object or, or exhibit they're actually looking at. Uh, what are their preferences? How do they want that information delivered to them? So those are the types of things we want to be able to take advantage of, is really kind of recognizing our visitors. So we've been looking at location awareness technologies for quite a while, myself, you know, a great number of years, and needless to say, I've been a little bit disappointed with the solutions that are out there. Um, you know, some common ones that are being utilized in different museums, QR codes, um, so many museums using QR codes. Let, let's play a game. What's wrong with QR codes? Anyone? No one uses them. Yes, they're cumbersome. There's a high barrier of entry. They're terrible. They're, they're, they're terrible. That sums it up. They're aesthetically beautiful, correct? <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, they're, they're not particularly aesthetically pleasing. Um, there's still a, a lot of problems with people understanding what they do. We have NFC, Bluetooth, uh, NFC, for those of you who don't know, near field communications. Uh, pretty good, strong technology if you're close. Um, because it is near field, but it doesn't really work good at long ranges. RFID, kind of the same thing. It works well close, but doesn't work at long ranges. Um, both of them require some sort of infrastructure, an additional infrastructure that you're putting in around your objects and your exhibits. Uh, Wi-Fi, anybody want to bash Wi-Fi for a little while? <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wi-Fi triangulation, we've been working with for years. We actually had a group, we're lucky enough to have MIT right around the corner, so I was really excited about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when some MIT students who were doing their thesis in Wi-Fi triangulation came and said, we're gonna make it accurate. Um, and we said, oh, that's great, come on in. And we gave them tools and put up Wi-Fi points wherever they wanted, and they walked out at the end of the project three months later saying, yeah, about 10 meters is what you get out of the accuracy. And it's a very expensive infrastructure to have to maintain to do location awareness. And then there's other technologies like 
and sonification, using audio waves and bouncing them around to be able to get the device to recognize where you are indoors. Um, but again, it's, it, it's not a very good technology. It's very subject to interruptions in the space and, and, and people moving within the space. So we've played with all of these. Um, but we have a tall order here. We wanted something that's not cumbersome, aesthetic, not aesthetically distracting, works at short and long range, is affordable, is accurate, is platform agnostic, requires minimal infrastructure, easy to manage, and most of all is sustainable. So that should be easy, right? No big ask there. Um, so the story I like to tell about this is we were kind of looking at Wi-Fi. These folks from MIT had just left the museum, and all of a sudden I got cold called one day at my desk, um, and I usually don't pick up my office phone, I'm glad I did this day, and it was a guy by the name of uh, Aaron Gannick, um, and he and his colleague Dan Ryan were both graduates from Boston University, and he said, we're working on this really cool technology we thought you might be interested in, we're, we're pushing data over light. And I said, oh, okay, well that sounds interesting, we might be able to do something with that programmatically within the Museum of Science, and we met with them, and they introduced us to their technology, and which is now a, a pretty booming business that they have called Bite Light. Um, and the technology, when they first did it, they were just trying to transmit data over light. But as we talked to them about the needs for location awareness, um, we realized we were onto something pretty cool here. Basically, the way the technology works is just any standard LED light from any manufacturer inside it has a chip. That chip modulates the LED light on and off at a constant pace. They change the firmware on that chip so that rather than going 101010, the lights are going 111010111100, and therefore each light can have its own unique identif identifier, a globally unique address with each one of the lights. You put those together like you would Wi-Fi, and you can triangulate your position. The best part about it is, is it's using visible light. So it's making use of the cameras on the smartphones. We're getting away from this issue about whether or not the technology is supported on Android, on Windows, on iOS, and just making use of the actual camera on the phone. All of them have the ability to read that modulation of the light. So we were pretty excited. Um, it uses a front and the back facing camera. It uses direct and reflected light. So there's some pretty creative ways that we can not compromise the lighting of an exhibit hall while still delivering that accuracy and location services. Um, and the best part was is we started to test this um, with not a lot of bulbs or saturation of the infrastructure. We were getting accuracy down to inches, which we had never achieved with anything else previously. Um, so just a quick video, this is their commercial video, so it, it's not museum centric, but I think it gives you a good idea of what the technology is capable of doing and the types of applications, which I'll talk about more. So when we implemented this technology, we really used a sandbox called our Connors Computer Place Exhibit Hall. Um, it's about a 2,500 square foot space, but it's really saturated with different interactives. So we thought it would be a great place to test it out. 
Um, our tests went great. I mean, we're presenting about the technology itself, which is a great add to that particular exhibit hall, a great story to tell our visitors, but then letting them, letting them actually use it to walk around to each one of the exhibits and get a virtual layer of content delivered to them was fantastic as well. We've been doing that for about a year. Um, you saw some of the applications of the technology that were um, shown in their video that are commercial, but some of them apply to museums as well. So we do want to be able to offer wayfinding. Our museum is extremely complex and large in size, so uh, we are constantly being stopped by visitors in the halls and being asked where the food services, the Omni Theater, the planetarium, the bathrooms are. Um, so we like the idea of being able to deliver that kind of classic wayfinding within a complex environment. But it's also the interpretations. How can we deliver layers of content, video, audio, um, on these devices around our objects or our exhibits? How can we allow people to interact with exhibits from their mobile device, but only when they're in the location of that particular exhibit? So we've done some work in that area. And then the other thing we found is we do a lot of work with accessibility. And we found that accessibility, this provides us a huge opportunity. In fact, one of the next tests we're really doing is audio interpretations based on granular location to allow non-sighted blind visitors uh, to actually understand what's around them within the exhibit halls and what objects are there, and even give them some ability to interact um, on their mobile device. So we're pretty excited about that as well. Um, and then the list goes on from there. Um, you know, besides the ADA type of accessibility, we're talking about cognitive accessibility. How can we layer content and by people providing their preferences when they come into the exhibit hall? Um, and their preferences might simply be their age or their education level, deliver content to them in a way that's appropriate to kind of where their entry point is. Um, it doesn't create content for you, so I apologize for that, but that's, that, that, that's another story. Um, and then, you know, we get into some other more classic applications of, like, the, of this, like push marketing. I mean, our dream is if we can get people using this type of technology for their museum visit as a value-added benefit, then now all of a sudden, if we know that somebody had gone to our live animal center and they spent a lot of time at our live, or, well, not our live animal dioramas, but our, our natural science dioramas, um, we can make a guess that they might be interested that there's a show starting in our Omni Theater on penguins in 15 minutes. And we can push notify them right on the mobile device, recognizing their habits, recognizing their patterns, and hopefully kind of leverage that to bring revenue to some of our venues that are, are, are kind of falling back in terms of revenue and interest. Um, and then at the end of the day, you saw the analytics on here. If we can get people using this and we can start to understand, uh, I always, you know, right now we try to follow people around the museum. I call it the creepy person with a clipboard. <laughs> um, you know, trying to understand how people move through the museum, how long they linger in different areas. This really allows us a ubiquitous, invisible tool um, to really understand where people are spending their time without being watched or asked. Uh, within the museum environment. Um, and that's our end game. We have, to get, we have to provide that value for people using these devices, but that's the type of things that you can eke out of this when we get there. So our next steps is uh, we've done this in this great exhibit hall. It's worked really well. Our blue wing, for those of you who have been at the Museum of Science, is three floors and probably 40,000 square feet of exhibit space in here. Um, we're starting to outfit that with the bulbs, and this provides some unique challenges. So far, so good with very, very high ceilings, a lot of competing light um, together. Uh, we're going to start a formal research and evaluation uh, once we have content put in and this particular wing of our museum outfitted. Um, and we're excited to see what we find from there. But, you know, w at the end of the day, what we're really happy about is we found a technology that so far seems to be the only one we've found that's accurate sustainable and affordable. So that's it. I don't know if we have time for a couple questions. Uh, yes, we definitely have time for a couple of questions and perhaps we can reset the projector as we do. Uh, I'm curious what it's worth. So the cost of modifying the LED bulb is generally about three to 10 cents per bulb. Um, so Bite Light does not sell the bulbs directly. What they do is they provide the spec to the manufacturers. Um, so Philips, Soleus, uh, GE, they're working with all the major manufacturers. Uh, basically, when you request a bulb of a certain lumens and a certain throw, you're just requesting it with the Bite Light technology and it adds cents to the cost of the bulb. 
LED bulbs right now, you know, range anywhere from $25 to $125, depending on the particulars of what you're doing. There is a sweet spot. If you are, like many museums, moving from regular lighting over to LED, uh, many of us are going through that process, it's a great time to get in there because now you're not buying new modified bulbs to replace the LEDs you already have in. So. Yes? Um, they supply that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what they do is they supply basically a back-end um, environment configuration in, um, so that you can set up your bulbs in your space, tell them where they are. And then you can either use a canned content management system that they have to just simply put in URLs or upload images or text or pictures for those particular locations, but they also provide a very robust API and scripting development kit that allows any developer on pretty much any platform to be able to grab that location information through a couple of libraries they have and then associate content with it. So, so people hold your cell phones at different angles. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Direct and reflective light, in fact, um, we, we had a little bit of a problem in the first um, iteration of this because the carpet um, sent off a little bit of a moray pattern, but we realized that most of the light they were getting was reflecting off carpeting um, as it was coming into the phones. Have you seen um, any kind of uh, effect on battery life on the devices compared to when you went before? Generally not. Um, you know, the, the manufacturers have gotten really good about the power consumption on having the cameras on, and it's not, uh, the camera is generally on all the time, it's just not on in the fact that it's grabbing every single pixel out of that and trying to interpolate that into an image. Um, so, yeah, very little effect. I, I want to make sure I'm being uh, respectful of time. We, we, we are still good. I, I'd okay. say one or two more questions, Excellent. two if they're quick. Yes. Have you only used it in apps that you've developed and you hand out? Is it sort of just downloadable for anyone? It is not currently downloadable. All of the applications that are being done, Byte Light's working really heavily with the retail and the government market right now, and they have uh, their own test sites that they're using pretty widely. The government actually is employing it um, in more than a test. They're actually using it, the U.S. Navy. Um, so right now, generally, um, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's not available for public download, but it should be soon. So we're doing a lot more testing in that particular space, but we've done tests um, to try to figure out range. And, and the great thing about it is it's light. If the light is visible and it can reach the camera, um, it does a really good job of interpolating the distance from that particular light. And where you have multiple light sources, multiple floors, um, it is triangulating it in the same way uh, based on the distance to each one of those lights that GPS would, would satellite. It does not. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So our next speaker will talk about the benefits and possibilities of online presentation of museums' digital collections. He is Jiri Frank, project coordinator in the Department of Paleontology at the National Museum Prague, and he will also help you learn how better to pronounce his name than <laughs> <laughs> So hi everyone, my name is Yuri. Um, so I will talk about the benefits and possibilities for the content provider for publishing the content online. And actually my presentation is structured in three case studies or three uh, inspiring uh, <clears throat> possibilities. So the first will be more general, actually what they can get the content providers uh, from, from open up projects. So <clears throat> it will be like a kind of schema uh, the second one is a uh, direct impact of what can happen with your collections. This will be about the gaming, so I'll show some games. And the third one is, is more serious, that actually even the small collection in a very small region museum can have a high impact of the global questions uh, we're facing right now. Uh, before I will talk uh, about the scheme, I need to introduce uh, two things. Uh, one is the Open Up Project, which is the EU-funded project running uh, the third year right now. And uh, his... <clears throat> task is to mobilize the uh, digital collections uh, from European institutions, from nature history domain, uh, create some technical infrastructure pipeline, how to get them published online and publish them on a European portal. 
I mentioned Europeana, so Europeana portal is a long-term EU-funded project, uh, actually representing the European cultural heritage uh, collections uh, uh, from a couple of hundreds of content providers, so the portal already providing the access to the more than 30 millions of the collection subjects, uh, which are from different domains, architecture, history, art, uh, also literature from BHL, and also nature history. So Open Up already provides to Europeana more than one and a half million of the digital uh, uh, multimedia objects as uh, images, sound files, videos, or illustrations. Uh, when I had a workshop with the content providers beginning of this year, uh, I uh, talking about the Open Up with them, uh, I just realized that they really don't understand their global impact, what they can get if they open their collections and publish them online. So I started creating some like a network with relations and elements, and after a while I had a huge net with a lot of possibility solutions, which is very hard to demonstrate, and we can talk about it one hour. Uh, uh, so I reduced it really and just really implemented it on the Open Up project, and I will show it to you right now. Um, so I split the area into two uh, fields, like a public relations, so the real visibility, and the technology aspects, so the technology infrastructure, which actually help them to get the content online. Uh, the, the green bubbles, I hope you see it, uh, uh, actually are representing the core elements of the project. So in the PR is, is the visibility of the content and the institution on the European portal. Uh, the yellow bubbles showing the, the target audiences, so actually those are the users, the visitors of the portal you can actually see or interact with your content. So, uh, and, and, the, and the blue ones are the, the possibilities from their visits. So um, one of the audiences is broad public, could be anybody, so it could be potential museum visitors. Uh, which can see yeah, this very nice skeleton I would like to see in live on its full site, so let's go there. I know uh, from where is it, because European I actually uh, harvest your content, have a full set of metadata, so, uh, and also the, it's leading the content back to your institutions or your portal, so it's like keeping the track with your institutions, also you can define the copyrights, so we are going creative common licenses, so you can define what can happen with your content, uh, depending how much, how much open you will like it, and Martin Herlian will talk about it today afternoon, open or not open your data. Uh, the second group is very interesting, actually our academics and teachers, so they can use your content for education. Uh, important group is a taxonomist or a scientist and researcher, so they can use your content directly, independent, it's, it's nature history or history, so if it's a higher resolution images, they can work with directly, create articles, or offer you a, a scientific collaboration, uh, or even actually exchange of a collection, so like to visit the collection, see it in live, so it's creating quite a lot of possibilities. And also other institutions see your, your content, what you have. So there could be possibilities of the collaboration between the institutions, exchange of data, expertise, and also inviting for proposals for a project. So it's possible also how to get the funding outside. Uh, we are not publishing in open up just the, the Europeana portal. We're also using different portals, such so as the BioCase or GeoCase uh, or GBIF, but this is more for the scientific community. And also, if you are using uh, some, some kind of project uh, to publish your data, you can use also the dissemination activities of the project. So, uh, for example, virtual exhibitions, uh, let's say newsletter, social media, spread the word around, uh, promotion materials, and also conference and events like uh, this one. So your institution could be promoted through the content or, or uh, directly or as, a, as your institution. So all those aspects working together. On the other field, uh, it's important actually how you can get your data online if you have various data sets. So it's important to have uh, some, uh, some software which is able to handle actually different data sets, different data to unify them and uh, allow them actually uh, to be published. So we are using BioCase installation which is actually able to convert different data sets, let's say uh, from Excel, Access, SQL and uh, unify actually the data. Then the map the data to the standard, so it's able to research and I publish on. We are using ABCD, built on Darwin Core. And also, um, this software usually have its own portal as well, so you're not necessary to just publish just on Europeana, but you publish actually on the, on the software support portal. Uh, if you're using actually the publishing of your data in some infrastructure as a, as a project, so the project usually supporting the support or providing a support, uh, so it will help you with the, in the installation of the software which is unified your data. Also, uh, develop some toolkits so you can check the data quality if you have a typos, if your multimedia material is a proper format, uh, resolutions. Also, it's checking the data if they are mapped. So it's the first or so second round check going still around. So you are just sure that your data are published uh, correctly and are searchable. 
and also documentation, so guidelines, white papers, publications, also for the sustainability in the future to, to let the, the content providers know actually what they can do after the project. And uh, we also develop, uh, which is a very important thing, a uh, platform which is enriching the metadata. So you have some metadata or have your institutions, but it's good if you can have, use external services to enrich your metadata, for example, by common names, synonyms, which is actually increasing the searchability of your data outside. And uh, this is also on, on the way from your institution to the, to the portal. And also, important is uh, attach or tag your uh, information by the by the protocols uh, which are able to, or, or enabling your uh, data to be published. So we are using OIE PMH protocol uh, for that, which is used by the most of the public portals. So all those aspects working again together. And what they are creating, they're creating the access to your uh, data. data. So you can have actually the, the PR, or, but you can actually good have the benefits and possibilities also even from the technical infrastructure when you publish your data out. So it was just in a nutshell uh, uh, the, the possibilities for the contemporaries in the open up project. Now I will switch to the more funny part. So, okay, so our data are out and uh, we were contacted uh, by the consortium preparing the proposals. Well, we are preparing a project and we would like to actually uh, demonstrate uh, what it's possible to do with your data. For example, to create the communication between the memory institutions and creative industry. So how would actually your European Creative Project uh, <clears throat> started. So they are creating the prototypes and case studies of this cooperation in the several domains. So there are the five pilots, history education, nature history education, tourism, uh, design, and <clears throat> social media. And I'm running the nature history education pilot. In my team, I have uh, two content providers, National Museum Prague and Museum Fertigunde in Berlin. So we are providing our content through the Open Up project to the Europeana and two technological partners, ExoZ and Sematica. ExoZ is a serious game developer, did, for example, Klaus Atlas uh, uh, effects uh, to the movie, and Sematica is an uh, application developer. So uh, when I have those uh, uh, teams on the boards, I say, okay, what we can do? So we can do, what, what about the gaming? Because those are actually serious game developers, they have experience. So we decided to develop two games. Uh, two games which actually have different approach, different audience, and also uh, a different application. So one of, is, one of them is a serious adventure game, uh, strong storyline, uh, strong mission. Uh, the user need to went through the, the puzzles, uh, need to actually interact with the objects. So the game actually uh, providing the PR of your institution through your collections which are digitally published. So the user uh, interacting directly with your, with your content and also promoting your institutions <coughs> through the scenes. So we have uh, two chapters. One is uh, mainly in Berlin about the Museum of Kunde. So we are showing some of the exhibitions. This is the Dinosaur Hall. Uh, the, I actually see the, recognize the museum. Also, we are showing the behind the scenes. Uh, so try to give a glance of the users of what's behind uh, the walls and the doors. And the second chapter is in, in Prague, but also in, on, on the various chapters outside. The story ending by the great final. I will not spot uh, uh, the spoiler now, but. Um, also, there is an open end, uh, so it's giving the possibility for the next chapter. So for the next museum, for example, or next partners to use this collection, actually use a similar model to continue the game. So like to encourage uh, after the project also the other, other creative industry to, work, to continue with that. And of course, there is a lot of educational aspects. So we have educators teams. Uh, so if you're interested about it, I can talk in details with you after the presentation. I don't have much time with that. And I even have a playable demo here to show you actually how this works, like a mixture of the Monkey Islands, Indiana Jones, Maybe Tom Prider because we have a girl in that and uh, and uh, hidden click point objects. Uh, so the second game is a memory game, which is a funny. We took a memory game. Everybody knows it. So it's a simple principle, matching pairs, and we uh, put there some additional value and educational aspects. So uh, we allow actually to users to content generate users. So we can they can through API uh, can uh, uh, go to the portal with with the pool with uh, with the data and with some. Intelligence we work actually he can create his own sets depending on the team he likes so I like butterflies I can create set of butterflies But he can also do editorial so he will download the metadata from the portal So we have always a track with the content provider who is providing from which collection is it But also he has the information that he can create a quiz or question So if you match the pair you can actually play with that the model is open for different audio audiences So there is no story at all, but there is a addictive like, achievement systems and try to record into leaderboards and it's also uh, interesting, not just for end users, but also for the museums. They can use it as an interactive element in the, in the exhibition. 
so they can do editorial uh, that the information of the objects actually can uh, showing you where your position is in the exhibition, actually, where you can reach it and what you can do with that. So again, if you are interested, I can tell them more, more after the presentation. And now switching to the more serious part, yeah, which is actually how uh, even some more small museums don't know how high value actually uh, could be in the data what they have in, in their collections and what they can actually cause uh, or be part of the big uh, impact if they will publish their content online. So this is a story about three actors. Uh, one of the actors is National Museum in Prague. Uh, the museum actually comes from several museums, like nature, history, art, ethnics. And those museums have departments, uh, like uh, from, from the nature history, for example, paleontology, zoology, botany. They have the, the curators, the staff working, and then working with the data. The second actor is the Nature Conservation Agency of Czech Republic. What they are doing, they are doing field observations, they are going out, observing animals, collecting the few observation data, doing uh, analysis of, the, of those data and visualization. So on the one side, you have the few observation data. On the other hand, you have a collections data. But what, actually, what are the collections data? So if you have a look on the, on the classical labels, so you have the original name, revised name, optional. You have the identifier, uh, locality, date of publishing, uh, the date of collecting, and a collector. But particularly those informations like the locality, the date, and, and the name, actually are the biodiversity historical data, which are very valuable for the agency. I will tell you why. Just the label is of this very lovely mushroom on the size of just a few millimeters. And uh, what the agency actually is doing, uh, it's, it's a visualization of the data, for example, occurrences of interactive maps, which are supported by the government of uh, nature preservation or nature, uh, nature environment. And when I searched actually through these maps, I found that, well, they have the blind maps with this mushroom. So I contacted the agency and asked them, well, why don't actually showing the occurrences of those? And they told me, we don't have the data. But I said, well, but we have the data in our collections, in our labels. So they're asking, oh, that's great. So how we can reach them? They are published online. I told them, well, not. So what they can do, so they will in the ideal world contact the museum, and the museum have a complex database. They can say, yeah, this, you can actually uh, get these data sets, export it, and use it. But it's not our case, so they said, yeah, it's nature history, go to the nature history museum. They told them, well, it's a mushroom, so go to the department of ecology. Okay, go to the curator. Yeah, yeah, Joseph is working with this mushroom, and he has various data sets, like in five different formats. So you can see, and you need to dig really inside the data. So you can see there's really time and efforts. You need to go down, and the agency just give up because it's not, not worth it for them. So this is the wrong model. So we have the two options, actually, how to change it. Uh, so you can use the, like, like open up project, so actually uh, unify your collection through the biocase and publish it online through the Europeana. But the problem is actually if you are doing this, you're usually doing some selection of the contents. You are not publishing everything what you, what you have. But for the agency, it's actually important to have the whole set of data because they are actually uh, not curious about the images, but mainly of the information you have, so metadata that you have inside. Uh, so for this, it's better to use some, um, some software, some collection management software, which is enabling actually all the functions you have the, in the project. So unify the different uh, formats of the data, then have a various user interfaces for, the, for the, your creators, depending on the age. You have also vertical, horizontal uh, uh, permission for, for the accounts. Also, the system needs to be, hand, be able to handle actually different uh, content types, like say botany have different than paleontology. And also, then you can create the complex solution for the, for the museum. But if the museum has several museums, for them it's always better if the system is able to handle also the other collections, like history or even literature. So we, we choose a museum system. I can talk about it in more details uh, later uh, offline. Uh, and actually, we create some kind of a relation. So uh, then the agency just contact ours, it's a web base, so they can actually have access to any kind of data. But it's actually both sides uh, relation, because they can actually take our data. Yeah, this is a particularly important uh, species because it's in, in a danger, or is a stenothermic, it's, it's a, have a lower uh, tolerance for some changes of the environment. So it's enriching our metadata in our house, which is getting actually uh, good value, I will talk about it later. Also for the other museums, it's much more easy to access our data exchange also for the police and customs, so they can prevent the illegal business or transport to the customs because they can very fast reach your data and actually compare, well, this is the painting or this is the dangerous species which actually cannot be uh, transferred out. And also government, because we are on a government support, so they can easily control what are in our evidence, actually how we are working, what we are doing with our collections. And of course, if you are using the standard protocols, are able to open, so you can connect your data with the global data, with the global portals to uh, create relationships 
and also uh, uh, continue uh, with the cooperation on bigger things. So if this relationship actually is created, then you can easily populate a blind map by your label data informations. But what is more important, you can cover the data with the recent observations and create actually a model uh, back in time, like a BioSD model of the occurrences uh, in the back in time and space. So you see actually the species occurrences on some places and, and appear and disappear again. And then actually you can actually measure uh, the factors why uh, the climate or the infrastructure of the city around. So you are actually creating very valuable BioSD data the funny thing is actually nobody considered this this year. We had two uh, big symposiums and now actually we are starting working seriously on this. Because if you are able to create the model back in time, you can create also the predictive model in the future. So we can actually be able after a while answer what will happen in the biodiversity after 10, 20 years. So what we are doing now, we are actually mobilizing, especially also the small collection for the small museums because uh, they have uh, small data sets, but they know their region very well, so they have very valuable data in a really detailed level. We are creating roadmaps uh, to publish their content online. Yes, and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost at the end. <laughs> and then we actually are able to really create a big predictive model of biodiversity. We are at the beginning, it could be running for 20 years, because uh, bio predictive models of the climate change is already running 30 years. But we start this year, we are preparing with London and other, other institutions around the world, a big project, uh, and actually this is the key. So even the small museum, even though know they have a great value in their collection, could be part of a really, really big thing. So thank you for your attention. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna start by briefly introducing um, Art Text. It's a, uh, an independent nonprofit arts organization with a mandate to document contemporary art uh, in Canada from 1965 to the present day. And Art Text operates a publicly accessible documentation center, publishes its own titles, presents contemporary art exhibitions and other programming, and offers research residencies. Art Text collects many types of publications that are relevant to contemporary art, including exhibition catalogs, periodicals, monographs, uh, audiovisual materials, exhibition ephemera, and artist books. And the publishing community that we work with includes, of course, museums, galleries, artist-run centers, and other arts organizations or collectives, as well as individual artists, authors, and curators. So the work of these individuals and organizations, uh, many of them are quite small organizations, contributes to a rich landscape of critical writing about contemporary art in Canada. And much of this material is available only in print form and often in limited print runs and accessible through a small number of libraries. So in February of this year, Art Text launched uh, eArtText, which you can access at e-arttext.ca. So eArtText e is both the online catalog of the Art Text collection, which has over 23,000 bibliographic records, and also an open access digital repository for arts publications. eArtText uses ePrints, uh, which is an open source digital repository software developed by the University of Southampton. A large part of our project involved the customization of that software uh, to accommodate Art Text metadata and the work, of course, of migrating our bibliographic data from our previous database into eArtText. Besides providing better online access to our holdings, eArtText offers a self-archiving service to publishers, authors, and artists who want to upload digital versions of their published works and make them openly accessible on the internet. So um, what do we mean by open access? I'm going to turn to uh, Tamash. Hi. Um so uh, ERtext uh, was is, is a repository that was created within a broader context of, of the open access movement in scholarly communication, which you're probably all familiar with, um, and uh, the Open Glam Initiative, which is the uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museum uh, branch of that. So the, the open access um, in scholarly communication is quite well established practice at this point in the academic sector. Um, the directory of open access journals and, and the um, directory, the open door directory of open access repositories um, lists uh, uh, thousands of, of uh, entries. 
Um, what I have up on the slide here is the, is, is the beginning of this story, which uh, often cited as the beginning of this open access story, which is that Budapest Open Access Initiative definition of what open access is. And um, you will see that it, that it consists of a continuum of permissions. Um, I have it up here to emphasize that uh, um, I believe that the most basic of these is this, the right to read and download um, the content and its metadata. Um, and ER text is, is focused primarily with this objective, on increasing access in this sense. Um, now, the principal goal of the movement, uh, the open access movement in scholarly communication is this idea of the universal and free online access to the results of uh, publicly funded research. Um, and the idea is that publications are made freely uh, accessible to the public, um, either because the publisher does this, um, or the authors self-archive a copy of their work um, in an open access repository, uh, such as the art text, um, as an additional venue to the publishers. So as I said, uh, it, as I said before, the, the Open Glam initiative extends this whole idea of open access and scholarly communication to um, the cultural, uh, digital cultural heritage information. And I, what I put up on the slide here is the, the principles um, of Open Glam. Um, and in general, you, you, um, the thing about Open Glam initiative is that it um, emphasizes the need to remove all barriers to access, uh, including license traps, um, what they call uh, license traps, uh, that prevent co commercial reuse of content. So uh, you'll see here that uh, some of the key players like Europeana and Digital Public Library of America have made great progress here in that they actually uh, require, for example, um, a CC0 license on the metadata. So that's um, uh, no restrictions at all. Now ER text embraces these principles. Um, for example, the machine readable uh, metadata access for um, and uh, the innovation uh, aspects. But given the context of contemporary visual arts publishing, um, uh, we, we, don't, we do not enforce or impose a public domain uh, CCO license on all of the metadata or the content. Um, ERTEX leaves this decision over which Creative Commons license uh, um, to apply to the content uh, to the depositors. And they, they're free to, to restrict uh, uh, reuse with the non-commercial uh, Creative Commons. Um, so the first priority is on increasing basic access to read and download um, the content for research and study purposes. And this is consistent with the so-called uh, green um, self-archiving repositories that exist in, in the scholarly communication, um, where uh, the open access repositories as, exist as avenues for additional access while the publisher actually retains uh, copyright. Um, so wh why, what are the benefits? Why, why did uh, Artex decide to go this route to promote open access uh, through, um, promote this uh, access distribution model which is strongly rooted in scholarly publishing? Um, well, the main advantage, of course, of open access is that it results in greater visibility, readership, and impact. And this has been demonstrated very clearly through, through various studies. Now, our text collection is focused on critical writing, which is usually found in exhibition catalogs and anthologies. Um, these are not the same format as the dominant form of communication in, uh, in science, which is the academic journal article. Uh, but the principles of communication of research results to the public, uh, the necessity of an open circulation of ideas, possibility of building upon previous work remain the same as in the academic uh, field. So I believe that uh, the predicate of open access, which um, again going back to that definition, is the willingness of authors to provide access to the fruits of their research without payment uh, for the sake of inquiry and knowledge does also exist in this, in this space. And our text has already been providing access to the publications of many museums and galleries uh, through their physical library collection in print form uh, over the last 30 years. But there is an increased expectation um, from researchers to find all this information online, not have to travel to the physical library. Um, so the increased accessibility and discoverability of open access content uh, leads to new audiences, um, 
and most importantly, the fulfillment of the public mission of uh, cultural and research institutions that uh, participate. Um, and and uh, in addition, uh, placing the content within a thematic repository, um, like ER text, gives it uh, what I, I call that emergent properties, um, which is uh, as, a part, as, as a result of being a part of a collection of publications on the topic of visual arts. So let's uh, pass it back to Corinna okay. here, who will talk about it. All right, so during the testing phase of this project, which was last fall, we worked with a local artist-run center called uh, the Centre des Arts Actuels Skull. And um, that was just in order to test run and sort of assess the, the deposit process with a small publisher. So Skull is an artist-run center that supports emerging art and experimentation in visual arts. They're representative of many artist-run centers across Canada, both in terms of their activities and also because they're a very small organization with just uh, three full-time equivalent staff. Their programming includes exhibitions, artist talks, master classes, and workshops. They support off-site initiatives and special events, and they often partner with other arts groups, organizations, and community members. Um, here is this is a screenshot of their website, of the uh, publications page of their website, where they make available many of their publications uh, to read online and also for sale. So Skull publishes exhibition catalogs, uh, critical essays, special periodical issues, and artist publications. And we approached them as a partner during our testing phase in part uh, because the majority of their publications are already publicly available online under a Creative Commons license. So this is just a screenshot of the publications from Skull that have been uploaded into ER text. So there isn't time to really discuss the you know, entire self-archiving process, but I am gonna talk about some of the major points of that process. Um, of course, the first thing is to keep things as simple as possible. As I already mentioned, many of the publishers in the visual arts community that we work with are very small organizations with limited resources. And we realize that asking these publishers to take the time to upload and catalog their publications is asking a lot. So we're trying to make the deposit process as simple as possible by having only a small number of fields. Uh, there are six that are mandatory. And then additional cataloging is completed by art tech staff when they review the uploaded documents. Another important point, of course, is rights and licensing. Um, one of the required fields is a copyright statement, which must indicate the rights holder for the publication. Also, before completing the deposit process, the um, depositor's agreement must be agreed to. So this agreement confirms that the depositor has the rights to deposit the publication and that they give art text permission to migrate, save, and keep more than one copy of the document if necessary in order to preserve it. They also give art text permission to make the publication and the associated metadata uh, accessible to the public through the internet. Um, depositors must assign a Creative Commons license of their choice. In the case of Skull, they had already obtained rights to distribute their publications online and had already assigned licenses to these for the most part. And so we were able to deposit their publications without any additional research or work required to clear the rights. Going forward, we recommend that publishers and authors in visual arts include a statement in their contracts regarding open access and ER text. Um, the ePrint software also offers the possibility of setting embargo periods. This means that I can set a date in the future at which a publication will become available online. In academic publishing, often negotiations between authors and publishers will include embargo periods so that publications will be available commercially uh, for a certain period before being made openly accessible. So this offers some additional options to publishers and authors. Um, in terms of file formats, we can accept many types of, of formats into ER text, of course, including text, image, audio, and video formats. Our preferred format for Textual content is PDF-A, which is a format for long-term preservation. So PDF-A ensures long-term readability of content across platforms. It embeds fonts and metadata and prevents encryption and locking of the document. 
and it's recommended by Library and Archives Canada as a, as a preservation format. To date, most of the files deposited in ER text are PDFs, including those from Skull, but we are working with some depositors to convert their files to PDFA. So while there are many benefits of depositing publications in an open access repository, as Tomash discussed earlier, there are also barriers that we've identified in our work with Skull and other publishers that we're working to address. So again, many of the organizations that publish on contemporary art are small. They have limited resources available to deal with the technical and the legal aspects of depositing in an open access repository. For example, the research involved to clear the rights for the online distribution of past publications should not be overlooked as it's, it's a significant barrier. The time and technical knowledge required to complete the deposit workflow can also be a barrier in a work environment where there are few people and many priorities. So although many publishers are enthusiastic about depositing in principle, they find it difficult sometimes to follow through in practice. Some organizations manage this kind of work by hiring additional <coughs> staff, often interns who are hired on a project basis. Um, Artex has attempted to mitigate these sort of resource-related problems by offering support to individual depositors. Sometimes we'll even upload and catalog their publications on their behalf. Um, besides the issues of time and resources, there's also limited knowledge within the publishing community about digital publishing practices and online distribution and licensing options that exist. So the eArtex project has highlighted an area in which the arts publishing community needs support. And we see an opportunity here to raise awareness within that community about open access, creative commons licensing, and other topics related to the online distribution of digital documents. We've been doing workshops for publishers and authors, and we have collaborated with some groups such as the Artist-Run Centers and Collectives Conference, which is a national advocacy organization for artist-run centers, and also the uh, Regroupement des Centres d'Artistes Autogérés du Québec, which is a Quebec organization for artist-run centers. Last month during Open Access Week, we launched our Publishers Toolkit on the Art Text website, which includes instructional materials about depositing in, in ER text, as well as educational content regarding PDFA, um, the EPUB ebook format, open access, and other topics. So we will continue to develop these resources in response to the needs identified within the community. And to conclude, I'd just like to thank you all for being here. And if there are questions, I don't know if we have. Okay, great.